All right, well, welcome as we gather here on this message for this uh, Maranatha Christmas. And I'm excited as we are gonna each week be bringing our focus back to the understanding that our Lord has come, that we make the declaration that our Lord is come, that the Lord is with us today, Emmanuel, God is with us. But also we hold on to the truth that our Lord will come. And in fact, that's the question that we're gonna be looking at today is what is coming? And so as we, uh, I wanna share with you a story of Sherlock Holmes and his sidekick Watson. And, uh, and one day they uh, were out and they were actually camping under the stars one night. And uh, Sherlock wakes up and he um, you know, taps his, uh, his uh, sidekick Watson and says, um, hey, do you notice something different? And Watson sits up, and if you don't know, these are great, like the greatest detectives of all time. And Watson leans forward and says, wow, I see a fantastic panorama of countless stars. And Sherlock Holmes asks his friend Watson, well, what does that tell you? Well, astrologically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. And I observe that Saturn is in Leo. He goes, well, what else does it tell you? And he said, well, it tells me that horologically, I can deduce um, that the time is a quarter past 3 a.m. He goes, well, does it tell you anything else? He goes, yes, it tells me that theologically that God is all powerful and that we are small and insignificant compared to his might. Okay, is there anything else it tells you? And he says, yes, meteorologically, it tells me, I suspect that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow because there's not a cloud in the sky. And Sherlock says, well, have you noticed that our tent is missing? (laughs) I feel like there's many people when it comes to understanding the coming of Jesus, um, they do just that. And it's actually one of the temptations of the Christmas season that we get so excited for putting up our Christmas trees and so excited for putting out even our nativity scenes. Uh, I, I did something new this year with my Christmas lights and so... You know, it's kind of fun. We actually have a light up flamingo now with a scarf and a Santa hat. So we're kind of embracing our uh, Florida Christmas. And so, you know, it's fun to get ready for the new season. Uh, Our tradition is that you can't sing or hear. We don't listen to Christmas songs until we've eaten Thanksgiving meal. You know, everyone has their unique traditions. But that's the challenge for us is as we go into this season of Christmas that we don't miss this whole story. And so as we were going in for this year and this season into Maranatha, we wanna continually each week be reminded of what it means that Jesus Christ did in fact come. He was born of a virgin, but also that Jesus Christ is with us today and we're gonna hold on to the hope that Jesus Christ is still coming. And today we're actually going to, I'll say, dip a toe a little bit more into that last part. And we're gonna look ahead a little bit more on the idea that Jesus Christ is coming and ask that question of, well, what is coming when he comes back? Now, as we get, we have two more Sundays and then two Christmas Eve services. And as we get into these upcoming Sundays, we're gonna spend a little bit more time in Bethlehem. Um, But as we go into this early uh, message in December, we're gonna try and give you a context of what is coming so we can understand the messages that are coming before us. The one thing I will tell you is the Bible clearly predicts the future. And I've made the joke often, no, I'm not going to give you a date um, of when that's going to be. But the one thing is, just thinking of Sherlock and Watson, is so many people tend to overstate the end times prophecies, and then the counteraction is to understate it. So what happens is you have like one group of people and they get together, and I will tell you, if you go to a church and the only thing that they ever preach about is the end times, that's probably not a balanced church. That's not where we want to be. They see everything as a sign of God. They see, you know, if it's a blood moon, they'd say, well, that's according to this scripture, and that means that this is gonna happen. Or, you know, they have a situation where, uh, you know, the, the, there's an earthquake, and they say, oh, well, that means, you know, according to scripture that this is gonna happen. Um, this certain Jewish festival is happening, why the stars are located here. And if you didn't know the Starbucks logo, what it actually means for end times is, I don't I have no idea if that, I'm just... <laughs> just seeing where that would go. But then what happens is people are like, well, I don't wanna be associated with that. And so what happens is they end up in this camp over here 
and they just do this when it comes to end times. And they wanna like, well, let's not talk about that. Can't we just go back to like Jesus as a shepherd and he's, you know, let's, let's talk about that. And so really what we continually talk about as a church is that we wanna be a balanced church. We wanna have a balanced teaching in our approach to scripture. And so we want to understand what is it that we need to know that Jesus Christ has come, Jesus Christ is present, and yes, Jesus Christ will come again. And so I have for you, if you're taking notes, uh, I hope you brought a journal, you brought a Bible. Also in the church app, if you open up the church app, click on that Maranatha logo, and we've got the devotional notes right there that you can follow along. Today we're gonna talk about four certainties about the future that you can bet your life on. The first one is gonna be this. There will be an end. There will one day be an end to the world as we know it. There will be an end to this big ball of dirt that we know that is floating around a big flaming ball of gas. We will know that there will be an end to the world and the creation as we know it. The, the main source that I've been using for this message comes from what is called the Olivet Discourse. It's the message that Jesus Christ has with his disciples as they're moving into um, uh, the garden, as they're preparing for the garden up, leading up to the Last Supper. So it's Matthew chapter 24, it's Mark chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, if you can grab a Bible that's in front of you in the pew, um, turn to Luke chapter 21. Um, I believe it'd be helpful for you to keep Luke chapter 21 in your lap to kind of give you a reference point for this message. All right, uh, so Luke chapter 21, we're gonna pick up in verse seven. And it starts off with, so they, they being the disciples, they asked him being Jesus. If I ever ask the question, you get a 95% chance the answer is Jesus. <laughs> Saying, teacher, when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? He said to them, take heed that you do not be deceived for many will come in my name saying, I am he. The time has drawn near. Therefore do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotion, do not be terrified. Why? Because there's always gonna be wars and commotion. It's just what we look at in history. Do not be terrified for these things must come to pass first and the end, but the end is or will not come immediately. That's not to say in this moment, it's not to say that Jesus is predicting that the end is happening, but that the end is coming. So go down to verse 32. We're gonna jump down quite a few verses, but look at verse 32. You might have to turn the page. Again, Jesus is talking and Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till the things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away. Notice that. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. I actually quote that verse a lot in a different context. I love the idea, and I just have to mention it, that God's word, even when everything has come to an end and we have been given a new heaven and a new earth, everything that is recorded in our scriptures will continue to remain. But one day, one day, the world will end. We know that from a biblical perspective. Now let's look at Jesus' own words from the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So he begins to give us some signs on when the end will come. What's interesting is uh, I actually met with a, a missionary at Cafe Surfinista one day, and their organization does something very unique. They identify people groups within our world that have not been able to receive the gospel of God through God's word. And so there are still some pockets of people that currently don't know a language that is translated into God's word. So they do not have the ability to hear God's word. And that's why the Bible calls us to be missionaries is so that everyone can hear God's word. But what they do is very smart. They actually will look at a lot of the younger people. They may not know their native tribes language in places like Indonesia or the Philippines where there's a lot of scattered cultures. 
but they also know English or they know a general language that is used commonly in the midst of the public space. And so they're like, well, we don't need to translate that because by the time we translate for them, um, they're a generation will pass and their children will know this language. They're very smart with how they do it. That's all I'm trying to say. And I did ask them, and I will say this, don't put on Instagram that Pastor Kevin said that this is the year the Lord's coming. But what he did say was that they believe that by 2052, there will not be a person living on earth that will not have the Bible translated into a language that they are able to read, hear, and understand. And so I find that significant. And I'm gonna hit some more signs here in a moment. But as we read that verse, the focus I want on this verse right now is that Jesus is declaring that the end will come. That is the quote from the text of Jesus. But also, there are things that are happening now that were not even close 500 years ago or even 100 years ago. And so we are seeing that there are things that are changing. But Jesus is saying the end is going to come one day. Paul also, the Apostle Paul, spoke to this truth. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll read it for you. It says, then comes the end when he, capital H, referring to Jesus, delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, and he puts an end to all rule, all authority, and all power. It also says, of some of the different translations there, basically just means all the civil governments of this world will come to an end. Everything will come to an end. Jesus said it, Paul said it. My favorite text probably to preach on, and we'll do this next month, is from Peter, 2 Peter chapter three. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be delivered, uh, sorry, be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? I can't wait to preach a whole sermon just on that text. There's so much to it. It tells us in the beginning what's gonna happen, but then it uses a really unique word. I wrote a whole paper on this in seminary on the word dissolve. And the word means to unloose or to free from its bound. And what's fun is that we've got a different, maybe scientific understanding than even what Peter understood in that moment. And we can almost imagine all of the atoms and all the elements just breaking into being dissolved. They are unloose. You know, it's like the idea of a building being torn down was another use for that Greek word in the common day. The physical structure of the universe will disintegrate. Um, what I wrote in my thesis was something like this. The creation will be uncreated. That it will come to an end. That just as God spoke and said, let there be light, and out of his mouth light shone, and all of creation came into existence, and all of the laws that we see of the physical science and all the laws around us, everything that came into being through the word of God will also come through the power of God and be dissolved. You see, one thing I, I understand is I love to see what the scientific community says on these ideas. And I will reference this at time to time that, that Angie can simply read these verses and have faith, my wife, and she's good to go. But some of you might be like me and you wanna try and rationale, well, how does this combine with our scientific understanding? And if it wasn't in the 1950s and the 1960s, what was being taught in the curriculum of the American public school system was known the steady state theory, that the universe is self-existence. It always has been and it always will be. What's interesting is with modern science, they've actually come with a different perspective that is now being taught. And the idea today is that because of the second law of thermodynamics, everything is actually degrading. Everything is experiencing energy loss, that no energy is actually being created. It's essentially having a heat death to itself. So this inner conversion that we see around us shows that the universe is not eternal, but the universe, even with our scientific understanding, using our modern technology, is that the universe is continuing to decay. 
which is consistent with what we see in scripture. If you don't believe that the, that the universe is decaying, once you hit 40 and you look in the mirror, you see a new gray hair every day. I now have glasses. If you don't believe that things are decaying, park your car outside and, you know, on the Space Coast for a week and your paint will begin to disappear and dissolve. We can see these things. And the reason why I do this is because whenever we preach something in Scripture and it is God's truth, when it is true, it will be consistent with God's laws that he has even determined that we see in our scientific studies around us. And so if you've ever felt like as a Christian, you have to leave your brain at the door and come in and just have faith, that's not the faith that God has called us to be. It's actually consistent with God's word. So we know that there will be an end. That's one perspective, that's one prediction we can get that we can live our life by. The second, I will tell you, is that Jesus will be back. Now to come back, you have to come before, right? And so that's why we wanna have this Maranatha Christmas, is so that we can be reminded that Jesus Christ came, that Jesus Christ is present, but also the promise that Jesus Christ is coming back. And that's the truth that we can hold on to. And so we can see again in Luke chapter 21, I'm gonna look at verse 27. Uh, he says, then after all these things that he's talked about, then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Jesus was the one who first coined the phrase, I'll be back. I actually thought about getting that t-shirt. He's wearing like the glasses and uh, the sunglasses, but I thought I might offend a few people, so I didn't. You see, when he uses this phrase, son of man, he was using a rabbinic term that was common in their time. Jesus was saying a phrase that he knew that most of the people hearing it would have said, oh, I know what that means. He's referring to the Messiah. He's referring to the one who's gonna come and reign. And they would have actually known the story of Daniel chapter seven when the prophet says, verse 13, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days. By the way, you'll hear a whole sermon on Daniel 7 in a few weeks. He was given authority, glory, and southern power, not southern, sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And that's how we know that he's referring to the second kingdom because the kingdoms of today are being destroyed. Again, we go back to Matthew chapter 14 and we go to that, that Olivet Discourse. And it gives us a, a great reminder there. And it tells us in, in Matthew 24, the disciples are walking with Jesus up to the Mount of Olives. And they ask him a question and they say, not only when will these things happen, but what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And it says, they ask that question, what will be the sign of your coming? Now, isn't it odd? Imagine if we were, you know, hanging out and we were together and you, you know, ask the question of, well, when, when can we ever hang out together? You're like, dude, I'm with you right now. Like, what are you talking about? And that's really the, the, the context of this. They ask the question of, what will be the sign of your coming? And Jesus could say, guys, I'm right here. Emmanuel, that's me. God in the flesh, I am with you. So what is it that they're asking here? And by the way, the disciples, they had no idea of a second coming. It's very clear. They thought that this was it. This was, all of it was gonna happen right now and in this moment. So what they're asking is, what is the sign of your coming? They're asking, when is the Son of Man, the Messiah, going to stand up before everyone, all of the Jewish council, all of God's people, and overthrow the authority of Rome? When is this gonna happen? Because this is what we signed up for. You know, in fact, you, you hear the story of the mom who comes, she's got the two sons. She says, hey, when you, when you go to your throne, can my one son sit on your one side and my other son, they're all, they're all finding their room in the palace. 
That's what their, that's their whole mindset right here. So they asked that question because they didn't understand a second coming. What is the sign of your coming? You see, what they do understand is that there's gonna be this like punctuating event. There's gonna be signs that's gonna happen. Their belief is the Messiah is going to rule over the enemies of Israel and set up his kingdom. You know, probably, I don't know if they thought he was gonna be in the temple or right next to the temple, but it's about to happen. That's what they meant by what is the sign of your coming, not a return. You see, in a couple of days from that question, Jesus is gonna take them to the upper room, the communion that we are gonna share together today. They're gonna have the Last Supper, and at that meeting, Jesus unloads the truth to them. He tells them, guys, listen, in as clear as language as he ever says in Scripture, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. They're going to take me. I'm going to be crucified, but it's okay. I'm gonna rise again in three days. And the response is, so which one is gonna sit next to you when you're on your throne? They still have no idea what's happening and neither would I because we have the insight of hindsight. In John 14, um, Jesus said to the disciples because he could tell that they were just totally confused. He says this, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I like the translation there, many dwellings. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So how do I sum that up? He says, guys, I'm going to be leaving and I'm going to be coming. I'm gonna be leaving and I'll be back. Ever since Jesus spoke that promise, that has been the blessed hope of the church for the past 2,000 years. We see Paul write in Titus 2, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the hope of the church. And I know that it's hard. I talk to missionaries and people who work in other parts of the world, and that is the daily hope that every Christian hold on to. This persecution will not always be like this. I will not always have to hide. I won't always have to fight. There'll be a day where there'll be no more. I will tell you there are places in America where that story and that hope is more found. You know, you do find it when you work in a children's hospital emergency room. You find it when you do hospice on the Space Coast. It's those sacred spaces that people are saying, I, I don't want it to keep on being like this. And they put their hope. And the danger, especially in Christmas season, is that we get so focused on all the good that we have around us that we lose our hope for the second coming. Because if you lose your hope in the second coming, I get it. I pray daily that my sons will marry godly women and I can't wait for the day that I see them walk down the aisle and they make a covenant before God. But I love my sons enough that if I pray that God comes before that so that they don't have to experience everything else in this world. And that's a hard prayer to think about. So often I hear and amidst our culture Man, I can't wait for God to come, but he, can he just wait until I finish building this beautiful house that I've been working on? You know, now we're gonna have a dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. You think that whatever you build here is gonna be better than that? And that's where I think that this is our challenge, church. As we go into this Christmas season, as we get to prepare, uh, just yesterday we were talking about, I make fudge every Christmas. I can't wait to make my Christmas fudge. I look forward to these things, yes, because God has come and we wanna celebrate that God has come. God is present. But also our hope, as it says in Titus, is looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, I know it may seem confusing that we're talking so much about the second coming as we're talking about Christmas, but this has been our celebration. And I'm not trying to ruin your Christmas songs, but I wanna show you that a couple of the songs that we've actually sung in the past two weeks at this church are not Christmas songs, and that's okay. 
In fact, it might mean that we can sing Joy of the World in the middle of August because the Joy of the World is always a true song for us to sing. Look at the lyrics. Joy of the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy of the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. You see, you hear that language there. It's not looking back. It's remembering the present and remembering that the Holy Spirit is present. The Savior reigns. But this is a song that's like the party that we're throwing when he comes again. The Savior reigns. Everything we read in Daniel is coming true. That he is getting rid, no more, no more voting, amen. He is gonna reign eternal. Charles Wesley, uh, they wrote such amazing theology in their songs. Last Sunday we closed with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Born to set thy people free. From our fears and sin release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Look at verse two. Born thy people to deliver. Born a child. So I get why we sing it at Christmas. We're talking about his birth. But yet, he's already a king. Born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. I'm not trying to ruin your Christmas hymn. I'm trying to make it better because the fact that Jesus Christ was born is such a good news we're celebrating. And when we come to Easter, the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that he was risen on the third day, which is why we're here on a Sunday, is we're celebrating every Sunday the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not here on the Sabbath, we're here on the Sunday, the day that he was risen. That's why we're here. Let's celebrate it every week, and we do. But also, you can make your Christmas even better. When we sing these songs, knowing and anticipation that the best is yet to come. So we sing these truths. And by the way, the reason why we do this, did you know the second coming of the Messiah dominates the entire Bible? That Second only to the message of having faith in God is the message of the second coming of the Messiah who is Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard in messages that they say that it was giving to the church, but that's not true. Um, it was the second coming of Jesus. 1,845 times the second coming of Christ is predicted in the Old and New Testament combined. In the New Testament, one out of every 25 verses mentions the second coming of Christ. You see, this is supposed to be a focus of our hope and our faith. For every one time that the first coming of Jesus, the birth is mentioned, every single time. So we've got what? Bethlehem, we've got the virgin, we've got all those promises. For every one time the birth of Jesus is mentioned, eight times the second coming is mentioned. You see, that's the level of hope that we have. So Maranatha, a Maranatha Christmas, Jesus is coming to earth. Let's pretend that he's coming. I like the idea of like, here we are, we're a few weeks out. What do you think Mary and Joseph were doing? Let's, we want to play that game, we should. Are Mary and Joseph starting to pack? Did Joseph go to the local, local magistrate and be like, do I really have to go to Bethlehem? Like, my wife is pregnant, can I get, you know, can I get a pass on this? And they're like, no, you've, you've gotta go back to the town that your family's from, and you're from the lineage of David. And, and Joseph's like, what does that matter? Well, it matters everything. And all that came to pass. I love playing that make-believe, but also let's remember that we're preparing for his second coming. So truths you can live your life by. There will be an end. Jesus will come back. But I've mentioned this a few times. I'll make it a point to its own. There will be signs. Look at verse seven. Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? Verse 11. Jesus said, there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilence, and there will be frightful signs and great sights and great signs from heaven. Signs, sights, signs. Did you get that? Verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on the earth, 
distress of the nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing from their fear and the expectation of these things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Verse 31, so you also, when you see these things, see these signs happening, know the kingdom of God is near. You see, we can look back and understand that, that God is giving us God signs. He's giving us markers. He's giving us signals. You know why he does that? Because he wants you to be prepared and he wants you to see and know that it is him at work. You go back to the prophet, the prophet Amos in chapter three, verse seven. He says, surely the Lord God um, does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can put prophecy? You see, I love that back then, uh, lions happening in the Middle East were more common. We don't see them around there anymore. That's because they eat things. But um, uh, they understood lions, they roar just so that everybody around them knows I'm here. It's the only animal that really has, they'll just roar in the middle of the day and they'll hear it for up to 50 miles just so every animal in his kingdom knows I'm in charge. And that's that deep teaching that we're hearing from the prophet Amos. So what God is gonna do, he's gonna warn his people. He's gonna send a sign. His people will know that he's going to do something. Jesus had a conversation in Matthew 16. It says with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came testing Jesus asking that Jesus would show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered and said to them, uh, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. He says, you hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. You know what he's talking about? What he's talking about right there is you guys can predict the weather, and you talk about all these prophecies, and you know which one you missed? You missed my birth. Some shepherds had to come so I could have a celebration party. You all are the Pharisees and Sadducees. You're the teachers of the law. You should have been able to see these signs, and you missed the signs that were right in front of you. You can tell the weather. Good job. They probably were as correct then as they are now. They could tell the weather but you missed what really matters. Remember Sherlock and Watson? You missed what was right in front of you the whole time. He's saying, you missed me and you're missing me right now. You see, there's one thing that I can be for certain. No one ever has an excuse that they didn't know which exit was Bucky's. If you drive 95 going north or south, they tell you it's 262 miles away. You can hold it. I don't know if that's true, but they, they tell you that. And they have these signs all the way until you get closer. Then, if you notice, there's more signs. The closer you get, the more signs that they are. And it's actually very consistent with scripture, but it's fun. You can never say, I didn't know that Bucky's was coming. I didn't know which exit it was gonna be at. They tell you through all these signs. And that's what Jesus is saying. You missed the first one. And then he gives the warning, don't miss the second. Don't miss the second. And the second is that he's coming back. There was 300 signs the first time. The Messiah will be born from the tribe of Judah. He'll be born in Bethlehem, the lineage of King Jesus. Um, he'll arrive before the temple will be destroyed. He'll be born to a virgin and others and others. There are all these signs that were given and there are eight times more for what is coming next. And so the excuse is you have no excuse to miss it, that you should be ready. The Old Testament refers to the 70th week of Daniel. We'll get into that more next month. It says that there's going to be a seven year future time of tribulation. It's the second three and a half that things are gonna get really, really bad. We'll talk about what the great tribulation period looks like. But he says that there's signs that are coming. I wanna be clear. I do not believe that we are in those seven years now. Those signs are yet coming. 
But when I mention things like every single person will have access to the word of God, we see things like the nation of Israel is back in their homeland. These signs are shadows of what is yet to come. And it does feel like we're getting closer because you know what? I will tell you this, I'll predict this. Every day we're getting closer to the coming of the Lord. In Matthew 24, his rendition of the Olivet Discourse, he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. Some translation says, these are the beginning of birth pains. You see, I've never felt a birth pain, and nor will I, but I've been with those who have. And what's interesting is, it starts off, hey, I think I feel something. And then it continues, it's getting more painful. And then it gets more regular. And then it gets more often. And then you say, okay, I think we better get ready because it's about to happen. The baby's coming. And that's the illustration that he's giving here. He's telling us that there are gonna be signs and there's gonna be a relaxation. There's gonna be a war. There's gonna be relaxation. These things are gonna be happening. In verse 28, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. The Jewish people are back in their land for the first time since 70 AD. They were arrived in 1948, so a lot of us, it's like, well, yeah, they've always been. No, they went a long time where they weren't. We can see these things that are happening. The signs are there. You know, Jesus wasn't a Baptist. He wasn't a Lutheran. He was Jewish. And so it matters what is happening with the Jewish people. Jesus talks about the land of Judea and the end time. That's the geographic area of Israel. Jesus talks about the city of Jerusalem. They're present in these last times. We know that to be true. It says that we should, it says that we should pray for that your flight be not on the Sabbath. Interesting thing. The Sabbath hasn't been able to be fully recognized since the temple was destroyed. There's currently a group um, called the Temple Institute and they have been preparing every single element for the moment that the temple can be rebuilt. They can build it in two weeks and they can start having an actual Sabbath again. The shadows are there. We see a coalition of nations that is happening. Even this week, things that we see in Syria, the three nations that are coming together, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, are the three geographic regions that are mentioned in the signs that are yet to come. We'll talk about that more next month. You see, we can see that these things are happening. We can see that the shadows are there. Let me close with Luke 21, verse 11. The earth will shake and break apart in different places. There will be no food. There will be bad diseases among many people. Very special things will be seen in the sky that will make people much afraid. It's gonna be a hard season. But the final good news is, we will be saved. That's the good news. We will be saved. It doesn't mean that times aren't going to be tough. No, Jesus told us they will be. But we can be saved and we will be saved. Many of us, you're already ready. If the Lord came in this moment, you are ready. But you know what the good news of Christmas is? That we have the opportunity to reach those who aren't ready. The Sunday before Christmas and Christmas Eve is one of the best chances you have of the year to invite a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, a teammate. So, hey, you wanna come to church with me for Christmas Eve? Hey, you wanna go to church the Sunday before Christmas? Oh, they sing great music, the worship's great. But you know what we are gonna share? We're gonna talk a little bit about the second coming of Jesus on Christmas Eve. And I know for some people are like, well, why are you doing that on Christmas Eve? The reason why is because the people who come to church twice a year, they know he was born, they know he died, and that's all they know. So when we come to Christmas Eve and Easter, we wanna give them something different. And we wanna ask them the question of, what does it mean to be ready when he comes again? And that's gonna be the heart of that message. And so we have the opportunity to bring people to hear that message. Jesus said in this passage, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. My final verse, verse 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of God. 
we're not living in the tribulation. We're living in what's called the church age. That's the age that we live in today. But the church age is gonna come to an end. And the Bible says it's coming like a thief in the night. Thieves don't call you to tell you when they're gonna come to your house. It's not gonna be when we expect it. And that's the concern about those who are so focused on the signs. You see, the signs are referring to the second coming. We may not even be here when those signs come. It's gonna come when we're not expected. So the question today is, are you ready today? The last story I'm gonna share, um, let me invite the worship team to come up, is uh, I just recently watched with my boys the, uh, the old Kirk Cameron Left Behind. How many of you read those books, the Left Behind series? Man, when they first came out, I was like waiting at a Christian bookstore, remember those? And I was waiting for them to come out. What was so powerful for me when I watched the movie when I was young, and now that I'm watching it with my own boys, was when there was the youth pastor who comes and stands behind the pulpit. If you remember that moment, um, the, the, the youth pastor, they walk in, the pilot walks in, and he hears the pastor saying, I stood right here, I stood right here, and I preached God's word, and I shared the gospel, but I'm still here because there's a difference between knowing it and believing it. And that scares me. It scares me because I get so stuck in my mind sometime on all that other stuff. I sometimes wish I could just be like my wife and be like, oh, I believe. Because I ask a lot of questions and that's okay. He's not afraid of your questions because he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so, as we go into this Christmas of Maranatha, hold on to that truth. Jesus Christ has come, Jesus Christ is here, and Jesus Christ is coming. And you don't have to leave here afraid. We can know without any doubt. And we could be completely off on our whole idea of what this end time looks like. But the good news is, you can be saved by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can stand in your presence, Lord. Thank you for the hope that we have, the hope that we have in the Son of Man, who was the Son of God, who was born uh, to a virgin, lived a perfect life, and went to the cross because he was worthy and became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Lord, thank you that we get a chance to taste that today as we come before your table. You have not called us to live as fearful people, but as confident, faith-filled sons and daughters of the living God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You have not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. And I pray, Lord, that we would walk in that and exercise that our love for the world around us is so great that we want them to come here and celebrate that not just that Jesus came, but he's coming again. If that is you and you wanna lead this church knowing that you have to have no fear for what is yet to come, put your faith in Jesus. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. You were born to a virgin. You were placed in a manger. You lived a perfect life. But Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for your resurrection so that you can live with me today in the power of your Holy Spirit so that I can be ready to live with you and your kingdom for all of eternity. And all God's people say, amen. Church, as you stand, the kids will join us. We'll sing for a few minutes and then we'll take communion together. Yeah.